Hello. Nice to meet you. So do you have all the speakers in already? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, just a minute. I have to stop sharing. Welcome everyone. This is Contacts and Continuities, 500 Years of Asian Iberian Encounters, an international conference online hosted by the Ateneo de Manila University in collaboration with CHAM, Centro de Humanidades, Universidad de Nueva de Lisboa, and the National Quincentennial Committee of the Republic of the Philippines. We are streaming live on the conference YouTube channel and on the National Quincentennial Committee Facebook page. Thank you for joining us today. It is now 4 o'clock p.m. local time. Good afternoon from Manila. It's also currently 9 o'clock a.m. in Lisbon and 10 o'clock in Spain and France. So good morning also to our speakers and viewers from that part of the world. The Department of Environmental Science of the School of Science and Engineering and the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability are happy to host today's panel. We are currently in part one of this month long conference series and this is the fifth panel focusing on environmental history, plants, and food sources. I am Abby Pavis, and I will be moderating today's session. So this is the flow of our session today. Our main event is, of course, the panel of three speakers, followed by an open forum later this afternoon. We will entertain questions from three audiences here in the Zoom room, from YouTube, uh, the YouTube comment section, and from Facebook. Our community managers will monitor these channels and relay questions to us. So I invite all of our viewers to please type your questions and we will gather them and read them out for you later. So again, this panel is hosted by the Department of Environmental Science and by the Ateneo Institute of Sustainability. And this is especially meaningful for us in our work on urban green spaces and biodiversity so permit me a few minutes as requested by Nikki to share with you some of the living legacies that we might find uh, on campus. Uh, first up, of course, is very iconic of our Loyola Heights campus, the rain trees, locally called Acacia erroneously because they're not part of the Acacia genus, which are known for their sprawling canopies, very important to provide much needed shade from the tropical sun. Uh, a lot of our students and community members think that they, these trees come from the Philippines, but actually they originated from the New World and was brought to the Philippines through uh, during the Spanish occupation. But now they are very much a big part or uh, an important feature of our local parks, our gardens, our roadsides, and they are iconic of uh, the campus and the surrounding Katipunan and Diliman areas. They were also one of the first trees that the Jesuits planted when we moved from our old campus in Manila to our current location now in Quezon City in the late 1940s. Many of us also forget the interesting history of some of the familiar plants, fruits and flowers that we might find in our gardens and in our markets. Of course, the ubiquitous aratilis tree, which we have a lot of on campus the pineapple, uh, and here I show you a photo of us taking a picture of the pineapple uh, on campus as part of our citizen science program for urban biodiversity. 
uh, lesser known is the Kamachile, but we also have it on campus. And of course, the very beautiful and fragrant Kalachuchi, which are also part of our campus greenery. All of these, sometimes we forget these are legacies of our encounters and were brought over from the new world through the through trade, uh, through the Acapulco, the Acapulco Manila uh, galleon trade. And, and trade means exchange. And perhaps one of the most important parts of the Philippines that crossed the Pacific is the galleon itself, which is constructed of thousands of, of trees, hardwood trees, superior hardwood trees, a piece of the Philippine forest that has crossed the Pacific and reached uh, other shores, excellent timber, superior timber, resistant to rot and shipworms, and more and stronger and sturdier than, than oak. Many of these hardwood trees are now classified as vulnerable or endangered because of harvesting, uh, over harvesting over the centuries. And some of them are planted, some specimens of them are planted in our arboretum of 101 threatened Philippine trees on campus, which we hope will someday be a source of regenerative material that will restore our forest uh, ecosystem. So these are just some of the stories that we like to tell the students, the faculty, and the staff that accompany us on our guided nature walks, tree walks, and bird walks on campus and which we hope give them a sense of place and appreciation of the complicated, sometimes fraught history uh, that we share, uh, not just of culture, but also of botany, a legacy of the exchange of ideas, technologies, and biodiversity from over 500 years ago. And this afternoon, we are delighted to have with us three exceptional guests who will enrich our understanding and appreciation of this shared legacy uh, even more. Our first speaker is Dr. Paulina Machuca. She's a research professor at El Colegio de Michoacan and a visiting professor from the University of Toulouse. In recent years, she has specialized in the history of biocultural exchanges between Mexico and the Philippines from the 16th to the 18th century. Among her more recent publications are the book coordinated with Thomas Calvo, entitled Mexico y Filipinas, Culturas y Memoria sobre el Pacífico, published by El Colegio de Michoacan and the Ateneo de Manila University, and Historia Minima de Filipinas, published by El Colegio de Mexico. In 2019, she received the Francisco Javier Clavijero Award for the best book in, for the best history book in Mexico, entitled El Vino de Cocos en la Nueva España, Historia de una transculturación en el siglo XVII, in which she analyzes the introduction of the coconut palm tree and the production of lambanog, which I suspect is what she is drinking in this photo, uh, on the Mexican Pacific coast. She has been a visiting professor at various academic institutions in Spain, France, and the Philippines, and she is with us this afternoon to share with us her talk on the dissemination of plants in the Pacific, the other history of the Manila galleon trade, 16th to 18th century. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Paulina Machuca. Dr. Machuca, the space is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Ateneo de Manila University and the organizers of this international conference series, especially to Father Francis Navarro and Nikki Carsey. By the way, in the photo, I'm drinking tuba in Bohol. <laughs> Thank you. So I will start to share my presentation. Do you see it? Yes, we can see it. All right. For many years, the history of the Manila galleon trade has privileged economic and political issues. However, in recent years, other approaches have emerged in realizing the importance of the Trans-Pacific route for the exchange of social and cultural elements and the role that plants have played in transforming landscapes and cuisines on both sides of the Pacific. Today, 
The typical landscape of the Mexican Pacific coast is as shown in this photo. If we observe the coconut palm tree, the Asian almond tree and the mango tree predominate. These are all trees that came through the galleon, but nowadays the local inhabitants consider them to be native to that region. On the other hand, there are trees of Mexican origin that took root in the Philippines landscape and culture, such as the calachuchi. By the way, in Mexico is the sacalasuchiti. It is interesting to note that this tree preserved the name Nahua, the, the name of Nahua origin that is from Mesoamerica. And the calachuchi is highly appreciated uh, throughout the archipelago for its aesthetic shape and the beauty of its flowers. There are even streets that bear that name, streets that bear the name of Calachuchi, which tells us about the cultural importance for the inhabitants of the island. In this sense, studying the dissemination of plants across the Pacific becomes a highly relevant topic for understanding the ecological and social transformations as a consequence of the exchange of tropical plants between Asia and America during the early modern globalization. For historians, it is not only a matter of making account of the plant species that cross the so-called Spanish lake, but also of tracing their insertion, adaptation, transformation, and the use of plant resources, both in the Philippines and in Mexico. At the same time, analyzing the circulation of plants in the Spanish empire, is not the same as analyzing the circulation of objects. Plants are living beings that need to be transported under certain physical conditions in order to withstand long journeys across the oceans. And once the plants reach another country or another continent, it is necessary to plant them in suitable places with similar climate and soil conditions as the place of origin. If the plant manages to acclimatize successfully at the destination, we move from a stage of biological adaptation to another stage of social adaptation. This step is crucial because success or failure depends on it. We have seen societies that adopt a foreign plant are capable of adapting and transforming them in multiple ways thanks to the use and management of these plant resources. Since I only have 15 minutes, in this presentation, I will show just a few examples of biocultural phenomena that I've observed while working on this topic. Let's start with maize, a case of complementarity. It is estimated that between 1565 and 1815, around 230 plant species were transported between Mexico and the Philippines. Most of the plants that spread through the Manila Galleon were edible plants, such as grains, vegetables, uh, fruits, and spices. In the second half of the 16th century, the main grains at a global level were already known in the four continents. It was then that rice from Asia began to be cultivated in Acapulco, and corn from America was successfully inserted in the Philippine archipelago. This photo shows a corn cellar on a street in Cebu. It is impressive to see that this same scene could be located on any street in Mexico, corn with salt and chili, which is really delicious. Corn became a substitute for rice in times of famine in the Philippines. According to Father Alcina, around 1668, in the Visayas region, the natives cultivated corn as a complementary food to rice. Thus, around their rice fields, they planted corn and millet. In addition, Gaspar de San Agustin asserted in his work, Conquest of the Philippine Islands of 1698, that the corn brought from America has been a great remedy to supply lack of rice because of the ease with which it is achieved and the much fruit that it yields. 
This phenomenon is interesting because something similar happened in Mexico, where wheat from the Mediterranean became a substitute for corn in times of scarcity. Let's go to coconut, a case of displacement. An important ecological phenomenon that happened in Mexico is the displacement of native palms, such as Cayaco, by the coconut, as we see on the slide. In this map, this is a typical landscape in Colima, and this is a map. In this map, we see that the coconut reached the American continent through the Spanish in the Pacific, but also the Portuguese through the Atlantic. In the world of tropical fruits, the coconut palm spread very quickly throughout the Mexican Pacific coast. In the year 1612, the inhabitants of Colima in New Spain obtained multiple benefits from palm tree, food, drink, oil, milk, sugar, but also construction. That is why the word palapa is very familiar to us in Mexico. This early use was due to the traditional knowledge of the Filipinos who settled in the palm states where they taught the natives and the Spanish about the benefits of the coconut. The chili, a case of cultivars or new cultivars. The case of chili is interesting because it was a condiment that was adapted very quickly in the archipelago where the cultivar called Ceiling Labuyo was developed after the Manila galleon trade. This is an example of Ceiling Labuyo in Bohol. In this map, we see that Chile reached Asia and Africa in the 16th century through the Spanish and the Portuguese. Chile is present in Philippine gastronomy through various forms, including acharas, as seen in the slide. I would like to emphasize that many of the words of Nahua origin are preserved in the Philippines and are precisely about plants that are preserved in the Philippines are precisely about plants as we see on the slide. Let's go quickly to tobacco and cocoa, two cases of plant and material culture. In the case of stimulants, the Philippines received tobacco and cocoa William Dompier, in his Voyage Around the World, published in 1697, mentioned that Mindanao tobacco was of great quality, even better th than that grown in Manila. Ethnic groups in the Cordillera in northern Luzon also adopted tobacco and even made their own pipes. This is an example of the plants, but also the material culture that is developed with it. Cocoa today is considered native to the Philippines, although it is one of the introductions through the Manila Galleon. Sicuate, for example, the quintessential Filipino hot chocolate, is uh, one of the introductions too. But Filipinos not only receive cocoa, but also the Mexican metate for grinding the seeds. While Mexican women have used for thousands of years the metate for grinding corn, in the Philippines, this instrument was adapted for the elaboration of hot chocolate and grinding the seeds of cocoa, and the metate conserving the Nawa name as shown in the third photo. Let's come back to the cocos nucifera or cocoa and the case of alcohol production. The case of alcohol produ production is very broad. I will only say that Filipinos introduced the tuba in Colima and Acapulco towards the end of the 16th century. In this slide, we observe how tuberos or manangete, manangete extract the sap from the palm tree and then prepare it to sell in local markets. This is a local market also in Bohol and this is in Colima, Mexico. I don't have enough time to develop this topic, but if you are interested in the history of this drink from a comparative perspective between Mexico and the Philippines,
I invite you to watch this documentary that is available on YouTube with English subtitles. One of the great contributions of the Philippines to Mexico was the introduction of the technique to distill alcohol beverages. In the 17th century, Filipinos produced coconut wine, which is Lambanoc, in Colima and Acapulco. This drink could reach 40 to 50 degrees of alcoholic volume. The Lambanoc was the basis for the production of the first mezcals in Mexico. In other words, our mezcal, the Mexican national drink, along with tequila, has a nation influence in its origin. I have studied all this in the book, El Vino de Cocos and La Nueva España. Vino de Cocos is Lambano, of course. Let's go quickly to Piña, a paradigmatic case of ethnobotany. I will finish my presentation with Piña because it, it's a paradigmatic case in ethnobotany. One of the things that has impressed me the most about the Philippine culture is its ability or skills to make beautiful garments from natural fibers. Who would have thought that Filipino ingenuity would be able to transform, transform pineapple fiber into clothing? The pineapple is native to the Amazon region and traveled to Asia in, in the 16th century, thanks to the Portuguese and the Spanish. Antonio de Morga mentioned that pineapple was already present in the Philippine archipelago at the beginning of the 17th century. Pineapple is one of the best examples of how a foreign plant can be successfully inserted, adapted, and transformed by the host population. On this slide, we have an example of multiple knowledge involved in making piña clothes, growing, harvesting, fiber extraction, cleaning treatment, weaving, and embroidery. I'm not going in depth on this topic because my colleague, Teresa Nobre, is going to speak about this matter in a few minutes. But I just want to emphasize that we cannot dissociate plants from culture. And some final words. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the history of dissemination of plants in the Spanish empire represents a real challenge for historians, since it, has a, it is a story in constant dynamism, which has a biological and a social part. I am aware that in this process, there were dynamics of power and coercion. That is, that the exchange of plants did not take place in a neutral space. Of course, the colonial system privileged the cultivation of some uh, species over others in order to obtain greater, greater economic benefits. But it is also true that there was a voluntary adoption of many of these plans and that the motivation of various actors who driven by curiosity transported these plant resources through the oceans. However, this is an issue that deserves a separate conference. Maraming salamat po. Maraming salamat, Dr. Paulina Machuca. Thank you very much for that very interesting uh, presentation. I'm getting more information and more stories that we can share when we do on our walks because a lot of the plants that you mentioned are also found on our campus. And it's especially interesting that you highlighted it's not just the exchange of the plants itself, but also the tools and the technologies and how interesting that even if some of these plants might be foreign to the Philippines, over the years we have put our indelible Filipino stamp on, on it and they are now a very important and familiar part of cuisine uh, and even fashion. So thank you very much for, for sharing your thoughts. And I invite all of our viewers, I'm sure you also have some comments and questions for Dr. Machuca. Please don't forget to type them in uh, the chat box, whether you are in Zoom, watching us on YouTube, or on uh, Facebook. So thank you very much again, Dr. Machuca. And now, uh, may I introduce our next speaker? 
Our next speaker is Dr. Teresa Nobre de Carvalho. She is a postdoctoral researcher at CHAM Centro de Humanidades, Universidad de Nueva de Lisboa. She holds a PhD in History and Philosophy of Sciences, a master's degree in Integrated Pest Management, and a licentiate degree in Agronomic Engineering from the University of Lisbon. Her research interests focus on the history of early modern Iberian science, in particular, botany of the 16th to 17th centuries. She has worked on the appropriation of natural knowledge by the Portuguese imperial agents and the circulation of new medical botanical knowledge between Asia and Europe in the early modern period. She wrote her dissertation on Garcia de Horta's treatise on the medicinal and economic plants of India and has had a long and has had a long held interest in the visual depictions of tropical plants, especially in early modern botanical sources. She's here with us this afternoon to present her talk on A Foreigner Who Stayed for Good, News of the Pineapple's Arrival in the Philippines, 16th to 17th centuries. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Teresa Nobre de Carvalho. Dr. Teresa, the space is yours. Dr. Teresa, you are on mute. There. Thank you. I think that's that's that. Thank you very much uh, for the, the the possibility of being here, and uh, thanks for the Ateneo of Manila University, and also to Sham and to the all organizers. And I'd like to share my PowerPoint, but I cannot. I have not uh, possibility of sharing it. Please, can you help me? Uh, I'm not able to share my my PowerPoint. Please will, help me. Yes, we will. Someone from the tech team will. Assist. Okay, okay, it's okay. Great. Thank you very much. Here he is. Okay. So, um, thank you very much, uh, and I'm going to present uh, my Hananas Komozos. So. Today, I'd like us to remember an extraordinary achievement, the arrival of the Castilian ships, which set from, out of from San Luca and Barrameda, head west and reached the archipelago, which they named San Lazaro. The most complete account of this journey was written by Antonio Pigafetta, the Italian who observed the expedition's progress up close. In his account of the voyage, he presented the inventory with a global scope of the animal and plant species he had seen. Indeed, this was the first recorded and of observed biodiversity on a truly global scale. As he traveled through the Atlantic and Pacific, he drew parallels between similar plants, animals, and natural phenomena seen. Throughout the 16th century, the movement of Europeans around the world led to a global transference of plants and animals at an unprecedented pace. This flow of resources uh, include the species which bring me here today, Ananas cumosus, a bromeliad species. According to Vavilov, the center of origin of genus Ananas was the inland region today divided between Brazil and Paraguay. From there, the species underwent a long domestication process. Prizes for the sweetness of this pulp, its medicinal properties, and its symbolic importance, it had long accompanied the Amerindian in their migrations. The fruit had been firstly described by an Italian from Savona following his voyage aboard the Columbine fleet in 1493-1495. Unfortunately, the fruit was too sensitive to withstand that lightning crossing and so was sent to Seville in conserve, uh, conserved in sugar syrup. According to Peter Martyr, a Milanese humanist at the service of Catholic kings, one of the fresh pineapples which arrived in Seville was taken to the royal court for Charles V to taste. However, because of its exotiness, the king didn't dare try it. In early 1526, Gonzalo de Oviedo published Sumario de la Natural Historia de las Indias. Later, in 1535, as Chronicle of the Indies, he completed his work with Historia General de las Indias. He was a keen observer of the American natural world. 
he made reference to three varieties of pineapples, which were prized by the Amerindian peoples. He baptized the fruit piña because of its resemblance with European pine cones. The yayama or piña or pineapple, which is very sweet and dark yellow flesh, was cultivated by the indigenous peoples and formed part of their diets. Some were sent to Europe, but it soon became apparent that they would rot during the journey. For this reason, Ovieto suggested that crowns should be rooted in the soil of the Indies and then transferred after three or four months to the soil of Andalusia, where as other tropical plants, they might develop. These attempts to produce pineapples in the lands of the kingdom were unsuccessful as the plant's agroecologic requirements couldn't be met in Europe. It was only in the mid 17th century with, with the development of forest cultivation techniques that growing pineapples in greenhouses became possible in cooler regions. However, this feat is beyond the scope, the scope of this analysis. Pigafetta was the first to describe Brazilian pineapple. In his account, he, transferred, he referred it as sweet pines. In 1555, André TV, a French missionary who crossed the Atlantic and reached Brazil, observed the local natural world. In Singularité de la France Antarctique, he described Brazilian pineapple. With a clear reference to his stupid designation, TV named it Nana. So the Portuguese name Nana, Ananas, came from this uh, original Nana. In Brazil, the fruit was highly prized by the Portuguese who settled there. When ships on the Carrera de India made stopovers for technical reasons or to pick up supplies, many of these two fruits were taken aboard. As it, reached the, as it was rich in sugar, water, and vitamin C, the pineapple quickly became part of the sailor's diet. Indeed, whenever the sailors stopped in safe harbors or other fresh thought filling stations, they would leave pineapple crowns to take root. These would provide a supply for subsequent Carrera de India ships passing through. So in early 1560s, the species was taken to the west coast of India, and from here, it later spread across the east. From the native Brazil, the fruit was successfully transferred to the modern day regions of Angola, Mozambique, Zanzibar, India, Agra, Malaysia, and China. As it moved from America to Asian world, it was the consumption of the fruits, while still fresh, that consistently received the applauses. As a result, and attested by Cristóbal da Costa, the physician of the Viceroy of India that lived in Goa between 1568 and 1571, Pineapples, like other American species, such as cashews and peanuts, formed part of the everyday diet of the Portuguese and local populations in Goa. As it showed by Jan Jugens van Linchotten, a Dutchman that for some years worked as secretary of the Archbishop of Goa, cashew trees and pineapples grew alongside mangoes, jackfruits, ginger, jambos, and other Asian fruits. By the end of 1580s, Pineapples had arrived in, in the distant Mughal Empire. Brought, brought by the Frenchies, as Europeans were known, they filled the imperial gardens of Agra with flavor and aroma. Both emperors, Akbar and his son Shahangir, appre appreciated the exoticism of this fruit. Moving further east, pineapple reached China. Michael Bowen, a Polish Jesuit missionary to China, author of various works on Asia, flora, fauna, and geography, asserted that the transference of the pineapple to China came through the Oriental Indies. This missionary depicts the pineapple, fan polomi, as a plant which was rightly part, then rightly part of Chinese flora. As the Portuguese made their way through the vast tropical world, the pace at which the Asian, African, American, and European fruits and vegetables spread mark the passage, passage of the King of Portugal agent through the tropics. In 1570s, the Spanish introduced European and American plants in the Philippines. On these new world fruits, such as pineapple, guava, and avocado, and medicinal plants like tobacco, were a particular focus of attention. Probably because of the proximity of the Moluccas, region of the origin, or the origin of spice and drugs, there's no, no, there does not seem to have been an attempt to acclimatize cloves and, mat, and nutmeg on the archipelago. It is worth remembering that 
at the end of the 1570s, several works about the plants and animals of the New World were already in circulation with special emphasis on species which could be used in, for medicine, food, or textiles. Works as Historia Medicinal by Nicolas Monordis or the extensive survey carried out on New, New World by the physician Francisco Hernandez brought to Europeans a substantial amount of information about the flora and fauna of the Americas. Common to this publication was the reference to piña. Indeed, due to its dietary and medicinal qualities, pineapple seems to have been a constant presence in the Castilian colonial texts. However, less favorable agroecological conditions mean that pineapple varieties, varieties that grew in the Philippines archipelago did not produce fruits as sweet and aromatic as those found in the American continent. It, it appears that it was thanks to the observation and the encouragement of the Francisca, Franciscan missionaries that the cultivation of different variety of pineapple was successful in the Philippines. Not so much for the use for the production of fruit, but for the high quality fiber, which could be extracted from its leaves. But Filipinos and Castilians would not go without these, these sweet fruits. In a letter dated from 27 June of 1588, and addressed to Philip II, Don Domingo de Salazar, the first bishop of Manila, alluded to the significant number of pineapples that were annually brought to the city by uh, Chinese merchants. Athanasius Kircher, an erudite German Jesuit, uh, for this uh, uh, erudite German, the pineapple had been taken to East Asia from Peru, as you can read here. It should be noted that Peru is the, it was at the time the vast re South American region that could, corresponds to the actual Ecuador, Colombia, and Peru. And there the native peoples consume the fresh fruit, but also extract fibers from the wild bromeliads that produce clothes and everyday utensils. It seems important to keep in mind that the flow of people and plants between the New York and the Philippines that took place with, through the Galeon of Manila's, Manila's regular trips may have allowed to the sharing of knowledge and practices between different territories. So regarding the cultivation of ananas comosos, if one aims, uh, if one's aims was to produce sweet, juicy fruits, the plant should be planted in hot region with plenty sunlight. And this is the, the case of Batavia, a marketplace in Batavia. If, however, the intention was to produce fiber, the plant should be grown on land with little direct sunshine sunlight, sorry. Over time, the domestication of the species by native populations led to the creation of different cultivars, which depending on their characteristics were more suitable for the production of either fruits or fibers. The piña plants introduced by the 16th century missionaries in the Panay region were similar to those we know today as Spanish red. Uh, the best quality fibers were produced by leaves of about one year. This should be cut along the central stem. The fiber extract from the leaves of the pineapple plant was finer, softer, and more flexible than other vegetal fibers produced in the Philippines and observed by the, the European travels, such as cotton, abaca, or coconut. However, like, uh, uh, like other natural products, the piña fibers production was limited and seasonal. So the question was how to extract and make good use of these piña fibers. As noted before, the success of piña fabrics achieved from the 16th century in the Pioneer region was in part brought about by the combination of the native population textiles, textile skills and missionary, missionaries' encouragement of the activity. The initiative of education and training of local peoples seems to be largely due to missionaries like Fray Juan de Placencia. This Franciscan led Seville in June 1577 and arrived in the Philippines in 1578. Before, before setting sail for the port of Acapulco, he took the opportunity to spend a few months in Mexico. During this short stay, it is likely that Friar Juan de Placencia had a chance to observe the natural Mexican world and its peoples, as well as their knowledge and practices. It is not therefore impossible that when he set sail from Acapulco, he took with him some new ideas about the use of, lo of local natural resources. Arriving in Manila, 
he and Friar Diego Ropeza developed an extensive missionary campaign and found different pueblos. He wrote also several doctrinal and linguistic works. Placencia also encouraged the, the setting up of schools where doctrine and arts were taught. It's in fact, in early 1580s, the missionary informed the Bishop, the bishop of Manila on the need to create schools in the Magellanic archipelago, where in addition to doctrine and letters, the native peoples were taught in arts, crafts and crafts, particularly carpentry, iron work and weaving without, with pinyazuzi fibers. It was this conviction that training the local population and enhancing their skills could increase their worth as citizens of the empire. Native girls and women that were used to work with vegetable fibers, such as abaca, coconut, or cotton, were encouraged to weave and embroider using the new raw materials. Same, in, same years later, in a letter addressed to Philip II, Don Domingos de, Baltazar, uh, de Salazar highlighted this, the, the remarkable work of these peoples in the production of high quality embroidery. What they produce, it was in either skill or in its silk or pineapple fiber, fiber was notable for its lightness. The use of juicy, a local way of referring to silk brought from by Chinese merchant, you uh, see, allowed for the production of light fabrics. With this mixture of natural fibers, the difficulty of finding a continuous supply of seasonal produced pineapple fiber was overcome. Embroider for liturgical or secular use was produced at convents and colleges. Uh, their long tradition, uh, this long, the long tradition in the art of weaving allowed them to create works of great beauty and extraordinary originality, altar and other literal, liturgical clothes and many other delicate fabrics such as shirts and panuelos would have been woven from pineapple fabric and then embroidered with cotton silk or pineapple fiber, fabrics. By the end of 16th century, uh, these handkerchiefs and panuelos attained very high prices in Europe and Mexico, and only ladies of highest social, social status could afford to display them uh, alongside their gold, silver, and precious stones jewelry. And I conclude. Currently, bamboo looms and artisanal production techniques remain unaffected by the pressures of the technological advances. Nevertheless, the time-consuming nature of the production of these fabrics and the poor fin financial return of the craftspeople and agricultural producers has called into question the survival of this technique. However, the recent creation of new lines of financing aim aimed at safeguarding knowledge and techniques is a sign of hope. The future of these promising techniques is firmly anchored in a local tradition. After all, it has been 500 years since the Europeans, thanks to Antonio Pigafetta, first became aware of the Filipino people's skills in textile production. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Teresa. Very interesting. I will never look at pineapples the same way again. <laughs> Just last night, my dinner was chicken pineapple. So very interesting. The next time we have that, I have more stories to tell my family about this very ubiquitous. No, it's such a tropical addition. Like almost every household in the Philippines will have a pineapple in its kitchen or pantry. But Little do we know there's such an interesting history behind that, not just the botanical history, but also the cultural uh, exchange and the, how we made the fiber, how, how that was our own ingenuity and our own uh, innovation. So thank you very much for that. I also want to remind our viewers that uh, we have a, a community managers who are monitoring our chats. Thank you for those who have already sent in their comments or and questions. Uh, I invite everyone to continue sending their comments and questions. You'll be collating this and we'll be asking uh, our speakers your questions later during the open forum. So last but not least, definitely not least in our panel, I would like to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Antonio Sanchez de Mora. He is an archivist and historian with a doctorate in medieval history, and he has written on Spanish medieval history, archives, and archival history, the dissemination of culture, uh, cultural and documentary heritage, and recently, the history of gastronomy during early modern times in the Hispanic world. 
In the last five years, he has researched Spanish and Philippine cultural and gastronomic heritage during the Hispanic times and Spanish gastronomy in the context of the first circumnavigation. His latest publication is Las Viandas de la Mayor Aventura, El Viaje de Magallanes y El Cano, which presents a deep analysis of the food loaded on board for Ferdinand Magellan's expedition through different chronicle and primary sources. He created the exhibitions Pacifico, Spain, and the Adventure of the South Sea, organized by the Spanish Ministry of Education, Culture, and Sport, and Acción Cultural Española, and Flavors that Sail Across the Seas, organized by the Spanish Agency for International Development and Cooperation and the Spanish Embassy in the Philippines. Today, this afternoon, he will be presenting with us his talk, on Between Hunger and Abundance, Filipino Food During Magellan's Expedition Through European Primary Sources and Documents. Everyone, please help me welcome Dr. Antonio Sanchez de Mora. Dr. Antonio, the space is yours. Thank you very much to the Ateneo de Manila New University for inviting me to take part in this international congress. Let's share the screen. And so we can begin. So the expedition led by Ferdinand Magellan, which left Spain in September 1519 and arrived on the shores of the Philippine archipelago on March 16, 1521, was a historical milestone for its protagonists and their nations. The Spaniards set foot in Asia, and this was a preamb preamble to an interaction with its people that would continue to the present, even transcending the Philippine independence of 1898. So it can be seen in Philippine gastronomy, here to the meeting and exchanges carried out by the different people that arrived in this archipelago and contributed to the development of a rich and unique cuisine. Well, as we have short time, I, I, I will not develop all the whole uh, information that I had uh, previously prepared. Uh, from a gastronomic perspective, several stages must be considered in the first circuit navigation, some better documented than others. The organization of the expedition in Spain, the crossing of the Atlantic Ocean, the crossing of the strait that received Magellan's surname, the, the crossing of the Pacific Ocean, the exploration of the different archipelagos, among them the Philippines, and the crossing of the Indian and Atlantic Oceans in their back journey. Uh, obviously, we will focus today on the fifth stage, and in particular, on its journey through the Philippine archipelago. I do not pretend to analyze the, the historical events that took place between March and September 1521, the period the, during which the Spaniards sailed through Philippine waters and met its, its inhabitants. My objective is to show the references provided by the European writers, written sources, and archival documents about the feeding of the expedition crew and other news about the food in the Filipino communities which they came into contact. I will not talk either about how was that food or how they cooked them. That research must, must be completed or must complete the European sources of the, uh, of the first circuit navigation with other written archeological or anthropological references. Uh, the work of food historian Feliz Prudente Santa Maria shows us the way of this research line based in multidisciplinary studies. Today, I propose a review of the written sources from the perspective of the food history, the basis of an ongoing research on the following issues, supply of the expedition, diet, consumption of food and periods of famine, access to spices, description of the edible fauna and flora, and interaction with the natives in relation to obtaining or enjoying food. Each source, each document has a specific historical context in which intervene its author perspective, his intentions and the circumstances surrounding his writing. Given the limitation of time, I will citate the main ones to focus below on the references provided by sources 
about the feeding process of the crew and the Filipino gastronomy. We can group written sources into groups, chronicles and other primary sources, documents written before or during the journey, reports and testimonies of the survivors, maps and nautical charts, and secondary sources. The authors of the narrative sources have in common their will to describe what happened during the trip. They try to be objective, although some of them provide a critical analysis of events. All these works were written on the return of the expedition, either by some of the survivors or by people who interviewed them and were present at their statements. Some authors review, reviewed the documents available at the Spanish court, the works already published, and even the testimonies received from those who returned to the island. Another issue is its usefulness for the study of Filipino gastronomy. For the most part, food is something secondary, faced from the interest in verifying the provi provisioning of the expedition in its different stages, and incidentally, serving as a guide for the future supply of new fleets or access to valuable spices. Some authors showed more interest than others in describing the food of the region. Also, in general, it is necessary to bear with, with uh, to bear in mind the limited perception of Philippine gastronomy influenced by the European point of view. This does not prevent us from finding detailed news about some animals and plants, their harvesting or their transformation into food, such as coconut, rice, ginger, cinnamon, cloves, or sago bread, for example. Antonio Pigafetta's book is the work that describes gastronomic issues in more detail. Following the humanistic desire to understand everything he observes, he shows interest in describing food, its preparation, the use of specific utensils or techniques, and even cultural issues re related to gastronomy as a social event. However, we must not forget the work of Maximilian Transilvanus or the chronicle attributed to Ginés de Mafra. They offer us other points of view with which to contrast the information offered by Pigafetta. In addition, chroniclers like Pedro Marquez de Angleria, Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo, Francisco López de Gómara, and Antonio de Herrera, although they did not live that adventure, had access to many testimonies and reports, some now lost. All of them show us certain interest in food issues and consequently offer information with which, with which to complement uh, the aforementioned works. I'm not going to analyze the maps and sailing charts that illustrated the budget in the Armada de la Especeria. Uh, uh, they gather geographical information that is not entirely useful to know the Philippine astronomy. However, they offer us the European perception of the archipelago and its islands. They can help to place the news from written sources in their spatial context. A second group or other group is made, is made up uh, of archival manuscripts. The information related to food is secondary in all of them, except for the accounting list that we, when you define the expenses, detail the products of or work carried out, including the, stop, the stockpiling of food. Unfortunately, they are not of interest for the stage in question, since the food loaded in Spain did not survive the passage of the Magellan Strait and the crossing of the Pacific Ocean. As for the few documents draw, drawn up during the trip, because they offer us some information on the subject at hand, mainly about the spices they were looking for. Among them, we must mention the surviving logbooks, which offer us direct information on the course of the trip. The documents drawn up by the survivors when they returned must also be cited. These are the reports addressed to the authorities of Spain and Portugal, the letters, the testimonies presented by the survivors, and other subsequent documents. Unfortunately, they hardly offer information on the subject at hand, although they serve to contextualize references provided by the narrative sources. 
regarding the logbooks, sometimes they complete the references provided by the chroniclers or help to locate them in time and space. In addition, in some cases, they seem to be an adaptation of the notes and routes completed by some information about what happened. In this way, it is sometimes difficult to establish the boundaries between a so-called logbook and an expedition report. Francisco Albo's logbook is the best known and the most accurate. Also, the logbook of a generalist pilot provides extra interesting information, for example, to understand what happened in Mactan and Palawan, including food issues. Finally, I should, it should be cited some documents related to the expeditions that followed in, in the that followed in the wake of the Armada, since they offer they offer news, uh, new re old references uh, through their passage through the Filipino, Filipino archipelago uh, just in the following years. Although only some of those, of those expeditions reached the islands that uh, Magellan's crew visited. Uh, their contact with the natives and the information they provide about the food they found may be used to better understand the food context of the fair circumnavigation. If the expedition in question was probably the first direct contact with European sailors, as time progressed, the trips increased and consequently, both communities got to know each other. Several of these expeditions um, are more important than others in uh, offering us information. Uh, and uh, I will stop or in my study in 1565 and the permanent establishment of Spaniards in the Philippines by Ligaspi. So the arrival of the Spaniards to the Philippine islands was preceded by a long period of hardship, although they were not stopped in their endeavor to reach the spicy islands. Uh, Pigafetta insists on the lack of food to the point of eating rats and pieces of leather, although other sources qualify such circumstances. On the other hand, if some authors insist on the impossibility of stocking up uh, before their arrival in Guam, other sources such as Francisco Albo's logbook mentions that they got some food on the islands of sharks, uh, while Lopez de Gomara affirms that they had of a meager quantity of rice. Be that as it may, the lack of supplies and the difficulties they experienced, which caused illness or death to some of the members of this expedition cannot be denied. Fortunately, they reached the Mariana Islands before it was too late. Also, this was only one stopover. Bien, so the Spanish tour of the Philippine Islands took place between March and October 1521 and offers us an interesting vision of the autochthonous gastronomy. However, we should distinguish between the news of the occasional consumption of food and, their, and the interest of, of these seafarers to stock up. In the first case, it includes the capture of of har or harvest of some animals and edible plants, not all authors pay the same attention to it. Also, in general, they tend to be interested in what was most exotic or amazing to them. In this group should be included the news to banquets or food tastings, and as a result of the meeting with the people of the archipelago, they were not always enjoyed by the, all the crew. Thus, the news provided by Pigafetta, the author who offers more references, responds to his personal experiences and does not necessarily have to be extrapolated to the entire crew. In addition, some present uh, results from standardized rule, rules of protocol in, in insular Southeast Asia. These entertainments did not cover the feeding of more than 100 uh, crew members, although they satiated their hunger with this food. Another question is the quantity of what was received or obtained and its conservation, since it was often perishable food 
and they did not, did not have what they needed to preserve them. The solution most of time was eating it. So the Spaniards arrived in the Philippine Islands, the main focus of our story on March 16. The expedition ran into the Eastern Visayas Islands, skirting the southern, southern tip of Samar and anchoring, anchoring next to the small island of Omohon. Perhaps they thought they had reached their destination by meeting the natives of the region. They were not like those of the, who received them in the Mariana Islands since they found that it was a more complex society. In addition, the Philippines were not lost in the ocean, but were integrated into, a trade, into, into trade routes that connected economic centers of Southeast Asia, including Brunei and the Moluccas. Foreign merchants flowed through Philippine waters and even established small settlements under the protection of local leaders. And in this context of cultural and commercial exchange, Courtesy imposed uh, the offering of food to arriving vessels, helping business and agreements. Likewise, the ceremonial banquets in which the wealth of the um, and largeness of the host were displayed include the most valuable ingredients and elaborations, just as, to, uh, as those adventurers had the opportunity to enjoy. I would like to describe uh, with more detail each stage of this, uh, of this journey, but I think that we have only some time. So I will, be, uh, I will expose them quickly and, uh, and, and stop finally at my conclusions. So uh, the first uh, place to consider the Homonhon Islands, I tried to uh, divide the references in these two categories, food supplies and presents or occasional captures or obtention of food. Uh, only the supplies could be uh, uh, interesting for them so that they had more uh, food enough to continue their journey. The other, the other question, the presents, was only some, something occasional, more exotic references that, that a real, uh, real uh, sustainable of the expedition. In the, we have different references, most of them from Antonio Pigafetta's chronicle. Also, <coughs> sorry, in some cases we, we compare uh, the information with other, other references. For example, um, the other that I have uh, aforementioned. So we have here different dates, um, information about the about contacts, contact, and uh, the moments in, in, in which they receive uh, food, food supplies. Other place interesting for this, um, uh, for this question is the Masawa Island. Um, recognized as Limasawa actually, but uh, with some controversy about that, I'm not going to go on that. Uh, the question is that there they had time enough to enjoy different foods, different banquets. Um, so the, this presence uh, and experiences were very important in this part, at least in this stage of the expedition. Also, uh, they had also the opportunity to get some food to continue, not necessarily a, a good quantity of them. In their journey to Cebu, they had occasional experiences like that one of a big bat that they, they taste. But obviously it's very important the stage at, uh, on Cebu where they had the opportunity to contact with, uh, with an important uh, city and port. Uh, they had different uh, ex food experiences and banquets, but they also had the opportunity to, to load uh, supplies or to to get supplies for, uh, to continue their journey. Apart from that, uh, that stage uh, also uh, brought them uh, the difficult situation uh, um, 
to confront uh, to confront with uh, local uh, leaders, and that is the the question of Mactan, where Magellan died. Uh, regarding to food history, it is uh, in relation with uh, some taxes that the Cebu uh, leader offered the Spaniards to get. So the Spaniards uh, tried to get supplies through these taxes paid by the local communities, and that was one of the um, of the questions that developed this uh, confrontation with um, Lapu Lapu this payment of gods, pigs, uh, rice, that was not in the line of, of a local thought. Uh, we have here the information of the Genoese pilot uh, that completes the references offered by Pigafetas, for example. In most of the cases, uh, the references about supplies uh, center in, in rice. Also, they tried to get pigs, to get gods, so some food and cereals or rice. Uh, the other questions, other, other food or fruits, were more uh, momentary uh, supplies, something that they could eat in more or, or less quantity, but that was, but that was difficult to preserve uh, for the journey. As they left, uh, they left Cebu, they, they after so difficulties, they tried to get access uh, or to continue their journey. It is not clear if they knew exactly where to go. They, they stopped at the north side of Mindanao where they had the opportunity to get some food, but not very, not enough. And at the end, they, they continued to the north and they got to Palawan. Palawan is a very interesting place for this uh, journey, a stage in which they could really get supplies. Uh, we have different references. Uh, it's very important here, the, the information from the Genesis pilot, because complete uh, the information of Pigafetta or even Francisco Alba that also uh, insist that they, get, you know, they got enough food, enough supplies to continue, continue their journey. Uh, Palawan also uh, allows them to connect with the routes, so they decided to go to Brunei, Brunei, where they had a long stay, they had opportunity also to get supplies, also food experience, I'm not going to talk about Brunei because it's out of the Philippine territory. And after Brunei, uh, from where they, they had to, uh, to leave um, in a difficulties, so they stop uh, to repair the ships and also to, to uh, mostly to repair the ships probably. There they had also the opportunity to get food, although we, we, we haven't enough information of what happened there during almost a month. We just have information of, uh, about some occasional, uh, of occasional capture of, of animals and this exotic information of this, about these animals. They continue the journey looking for the, the Molucas. So sailing to the south, they met the, um, the Holo Islands and Mindanao. Sailing through uh, south and so, so southwest of Mindanao, looking for the, the route to the Molucas Islands, they had also opportunity to get in contact with natives uh, to, to realize how important was cinnamon and clove in, in, in these roots, not only harvesting them, but also um, uh, trading with them. And in these uh, stages from Mindanao, we have also the information provided by later, uh, later documents mostly from Villalobos expedition that completes the idea of how was food in this island. Uh, they didn't stop in Sangani Islands and they had a good opportunity there also in Bindanao River, uh, but I, we don't know how, why they, they didn't get uh, enough supplies there so they continue to the, um, to the Molucas. Um, something else to explain from the references from the chronicles, 
and particularly from Pigafetta's work, is that he add some vocabularies in some parts of his work. He distinguished a uh, vocabulary from a um, Filipino archipelago. And in the Molucas part, he talks about the Moorish islands or Moorish people. We have to consider uh, um, and taking information, so reading words uh, of this vocabulary, we have to consider also um, references to Moorish communities from Brunei or even from uh, Philippine islands in which there were already Moorish people. Anyway, uh, the, um, the influence of uh, Malay astronomy or Indonesian astronomy plants that circulate um, at those times it can be seen, or uh, the beginning can be seen at this at this time. Um, in all these um, chronicles and documents references, um, there are some food important uh, for the Europeans, for the Spaniards, and they insist in describing them, explaining them how they were harvested. For example, the coconut harvesting. Um, Mostly of the um, so the, the most important plants and ref, uh, are rice, ginger, coconut, sago bread. This food is also frequent in the in the chronicles, and the wines. Um, we have to be careful with the reference to the references to palm wine because the Spaniards call the coconut tree coconut palm. So in many cases, when they talk about palm wine, are talking about coconut wine. That doesn't mean that they didn't refer to palm, other kind of plants, palm wine. We have even references to three or more kind of wines, and we have some references to rice wine. <coughs> so to conclude, as conclusions, um, the study about food history of the Philippines, uh, this period, the references that the Spaniards offered about the food of the Philippines um, has to be um, distinguished or analyzed, not only from, from the point of view of uh, noting or identifying food, plants and animals, but also distinguishing uh, occasional food, occasional consumption of food, the exotic point of view, to identify those plants or animals, uh, we have to different that from the real obtaining of food for the tree. Um, it seems that they, they learned during the stages through the Philippines uh, that coconut was useful, that rice was common and was easy to get, and uh, they insist in pigs and gods. Those are the most uh, representative uh, loading products in, in, their, in their trip. Other question of the chronicles is that they insist in, in, in annotate, so in, in offer information for future uh, expeditions. So where they could stop or where they could load products. Uh, I would like to con to explain with me in more detail all these questions, but the time is, is short. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Salamat. Thank you very much, Dr. Demora. That was very interesting. Thank you for reminding us about the the challenges, no, the logistics of long sea voyages and, and how food security even in those in, in those voyages is really very important. We have a saying here in Manila that rice is life and apparently it was still true <laughs> it was true even years uh, before so thank you very much dr demora uh, and thank you again to dr uh, paulina and dr teresa for those very interesting uh talks and so much so many more stories that we can share with each other so we're happy that there have been several questions that have been sent in via the different chat uh, channels so we will go through the questions now. So let's enter our the exciting part of our session today, the open forum. So let's start the <clears throat> open forum with a question from Ruchi Mark Pototanon. And I believe this is addressed to uh, Dr. Apolina. His question is, 
One American species that was introduced to Asia was Solanum betasium or tamarillo, which became a staple in Yunnan, China. How come this plant does not seem to be known in the Philippines? Would you have any thoughts uh, on this, Dr. Polina? Yeah, could you repeat the scientific name, please? Because that's, that's very important. Yes, the so common names name, uh, change all time. Yes, Solanum. The scientific name is Solanum betasium. Okay, I'm going to search a little bit. Uh, and what is the common name in the Philippines? Tamarillo. I don't have any information about that. I even don't find it as a scientific oh, name on the internet. Okay, so Ruchi will move on from your uh, question. So we have another interesting question from Dr. Vernie Sagun, and perhaps all three of our speakers can comment on it. Dr. Sagun asks, a lot of introductions have positive results. However, there is a concern about invasive flora and fauna. Would you still encourage introduction of non-native plants and, and perhaps animals. The animals is my addition. Uh, maybe we can start by asking Dr. Paulina her thoughts about this concept. It doesn't, it doesn't depend only on the plant itself. It's not only a biological uh, process. It's also a social process. What do we do with those plants? For example, uh, the coconut palm tree for us in Mexico and in many places in the tropical world in America, we can say that it was really good. It had a lot of benefits for us, but some ethnobotanists, some, uh, some people, some sci scientists think that because of the introduction of coconut, there were many native uh, species, which nowadays are almost disappeared, have almost disappeared like the, the native palm trees that I showed. And the thing of displacement is because when we have a plant that comes from another country or another continent, and we find it which is more beneficious, or we can get more things from the plant, or for example, if we build houses with, um, with the, the leaves of the palm, it lasts more than if you use a plant of, of a native condition. So again, it's not, it's not to say it was okay, it was not okay, it was good, it was bad. It depends on, on the use of the people. And um, I think it's a very complex question. It is. We, we cannot say it was, it was good or, or it was good or it was bad. It depends on that. Thank you, Dr. Polina. Would uh, our other speakers like to weigh in as well? Um, hello, uh, Dr. <laughs> hello. Thanks. Uh, thanks. That's I th as I th as uh, Polina told us is a very complex question, and a very difficult answer. Uh, not because uh, only the invasive plants, but also the natural enemies of these plants that are uh, not introduced and the plants can become real invasive in our environments. So uh, it must be, I'm not completely against, but I think this, it must be very, very carefully uh, made. A every introduction, it's be very attentive, followed uh, and not... Uh, in a certain way, uh, in a free way, I think. You must be very careful with new introductions. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Demora, would you like to weigh in? Well, I, I haven't researched about this question. I, I realized that after the, um, the Magellan expedition, so during the, uh, the centuries, these introductions of uh, introduction of food or of, of different spice, uh, spaces in, in different uh, territories, uh, we have the information in many documents and chronicles, and obviously that uh, changes the the ecosystems where they. So it, it, there's a, a complete transformation of ecosystems. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think Dr. Sagun is coming from the point of view of a botanist or a taxonomist because one of the key issues in Philippine ecosystems now is the proliferation of alien invasive species. And they're becoming very, very strong competition for, for native species. So that's something that we're grappling with in, in local uh, ecosystems. Uh, our next question comes from Mikhail de Dios, and I believe this is addressed to Dr. Teresa. His question is, are there other cultures that have cultivated pineapple fibers for use as fabrics, or is this only in the Philippines? Dr. Teresa? Thanks for the question. Uh, I don't know other, other cultures that use the, the pineapple as a source of fiber. Uh, so I think it's a local, a very, very local product of the Philippines and is a, um, really a, a new, a completely new way of taking, taking the profit from the, this raw material. Um, I don't know, really, I don't, I don't have any idea of other cultures that use the, the fibers of the pineapples, of the leaves of the pineapples. That's great to know. I can add a little bit. Of, yes, yeah. Yeah. The, Philipp Thank the you. Philippines is the only country that makes piña clothes. I've mm -hmm. been to Brazil and I was asking people if they knew some process of extracting the fiber for making robes or garments or fabrics. And they didn't know. They, yeah. they even asked me, really? Are there any people who make garments from piña leaves? And I said, yes, of course, it's the Philippines. So. Uh, the piña is uh, original from the Amazonian region, mm -hmm. and they don't even know the use of extracting the fibers for making ropes or garments. It's the Philippines, the only place. So it's confirmed. It is unique to the Philippines. That's good mm -hmm. to know. That's very nice to. <laughs> that's very nice to know. And I, we have also a question from Michelle Eusebio. If the Filipinos developed the technology of turning pineapple fibers into textiles, was this technology transferred back to the Americas? Uh, and perhaps Dr. Teresa or Dr. Polina can take this question. No exchange. No, no, the technique was not exchanged to, to Mexico. Oh, yeah. um, my presentation was very brief, was very short. I didn't have much time. But I'd like to, to tell you about a technique uh, which is named ICAT. The ICAT is a technique that went from the Philippines to Mexico. I don't know if the people, the public knows what it is about, but it was, um, it was a technique involving textile in the Rebozo, in the Rebozo Mexicano, not exactly with the tissage, but with coloring the tissage. So I'm not going to explain in what consists the technique, because there are some works. But in the world of textile, it, it is very interesting to see how some techniques in coloring materials mm -hmm. uh, voyaged during the Manila Galleon trade. It enriches all of our it's textile diversity <laughs> and all these beautiful patterns and colors that we see uh, today. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Marie Andre Pallion. And I think this is addressed to Dr. Demora. Uh, the question is, do you think tuba were, was enjoyed by the Manila, Manila Galleon seafarers? And can you find tuba today in Spain? <laughs> tuba in Spain nowadays is, uh, can be found in some Filipino stores. Um, I think that in Madrid, and I don't know if in, in any other place, there's something really exotic here. Uh, well, the Spaniards, uh, they, they had to taste tuba, they had to drink tuba, and finally, why not, they enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, that's part of the evolution of, of gastronomy. And could we also, uh, this, um, this idea can be also extrapolated to what was already said about the, the, the textile production through the pineapple. In, in gastronomy or in, in the process of evol the evolution of, of uh, food history, gastronomy in the Philippines or America or in Spain, uh, we have three, three questions. The ingredients, the techniques, 
-hmm. and the customs, the habits, right. what people wanted to get at the end. So um, in the question of textiles, I, I realize now that uh, maybe there was a textile production in the Philippines previous the arrival of the pineapple and the natives associated the pineapple leaves with that other uh, local uh, botanical plant. So if they, they were producing uh, one textile with fibers like those, and they saw that from the pineapple could we get also that product, that ingredient, yeah. uh, that explains that there and in no other place was developed that technique and that production. So the food is the same. Um, the Spaniards arrived in the Philippines the wine, the, the, the grape wine had to be brought from Spain or from uh, in the 18th, 18th century or even 17th century from Portugal through the, the Portuguese route. So if they wanted to, to get wine to drink alcohol, they need another, another options. That explains the production of coconut that uh, uh, my colleague explained before, so the introduction of coconut in, in New Spain, in Mexico. And obviously we know that the Spaniards drink tuba in the Philippines. We have references from, from Manila Galleon in which we can read the tuba wine or tuba vinegar, for example. Very interesting, thank you. Well, Doc Polina, would you like to say something about that also? Yeah, I would like to say something about the piña production and the, the tuba. Yeah. Well, first, I have discussed in a previous article that the Philippines is a country uh, which has a lot of um, natural fibers. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's rich in ma material fibers. And they made, for example, from abaca, they also made garments, robes, and even the sailors, the Spanish sailors, prefer the abaca ropes uh, than any ropes that, that came from, from America because they say that it was very solid. Yeah. So I think, I think, because Alcina in 1668, he says that in the Visayas, the native use the pandanus tectorius the pandanus tectorius is a plant which is a little bit similar to piña, but it is smaller. And Alcina says that the native uh, use the leaves of the pandanus tectorius to make some robes. And I don't remember right now if, if to make some, some clothes. Mm -hmm. So that came to me, an idea came to me and I say yes, because I, I wonder how the native people use the, the leaves of the, of the piña to, to use the, to, to, fi to fabrics, to use fabrics, to, to elaborate fabrics. And I think that they saw this plant, which is similar to piña. Also the leaves are similar to piña and maybe by imitation, they say, well, we can get fibers from this. We're going to try. The Philippines is not only, is, is not the only place or culture to, to do that. In all the world, you can find examples like that. You see a plant and you see, ah, it's, it is similar to okay. that. Yeah, yeah. And you can use, uh, you can use the, the leaves or the fruit or, or the roots of the plants to do something similar to another plant. And the second, we have to make a distinction between the tuba and the palm wine because tuba, tuba is um, elaborated from the sap of the coconut, not from the fruit, but from the sap of the coconut. And the tuba is a fermented alcoholic drink, which is about seven, eight or nine alcoholic volume. Then the sap or the tuba, if you want to distill that to, to make lambano, you have to get into a chemical process of distillation and then the, the palm wine is another thing, which is very strong between 40 to 50 alcohol volume, which is another, another thing. And there was a question if there was tuba in Spain, but we have to realize that the coconut palm tree is a tropical tree, which is not common to this Mediterranean <laughs> area, Mediterranean region. And 
the the tuba voyage is very bad. I mean, the tuba, for example, if you want to transport tuba to another place, maybe in one week, the tuba will not be so good. But if you have the palm wine, as it is a distilled uh, drink, you can transport it like um, without any problem because, because it, it, is, um, it is already distilled. It, it has passed by a chemical process. So they are different, different um, drinks. I think that, um, so the documents that I read uh, talking about tuba in Manila Galleon are from the Philippines to, to New Spain. So, so this long journey, uh, obviously that is a question of words. So they, mm -hmm. there is a generic use in the 17th and 18th century of tuba wine. So vino de tuba or vino tuba that probably to, uh, is talking about this, this, the styled wine and not the, the previous uh, proce procedure that, that uh, um, you, ha you have al already explained. Because um, if not, uh, so if this wine from, from coconut uh, does, doesn't uh, preserve well, obviously it was not useful for the Manila Galio. So they had to find a, a solution. Yeah. And, and probably they just used the word tuba, although uh, can be distinguished these two different wines. I see. That's very interesting. Thank you very may, much. May I add a comment? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> just to, to comment what Paulina just said. Um, for instance, uh, agave plants uh, and, uh, and other plants from America and some yucca or wild bromeliads mm -hmm. uh, also were worked with in, in extract fibers in the same way. So uh, this is what uh, Paulina just said. Uh, wild plants uh, were used to, to produce ropes and to extract fibers in the really the same way as pine, uh, pineapple. Right. And it's amazing how these ideas come, with, how yeah. people get these ideas, how yeah. creative they can be when they think they make connections between certain plants that might look the same and might serve the same uh, function. It's very, I don't know for everybody else, but to me, that's very, very interesting. And kind it of is really, uh, for example, you, you have already told about the, the, the Alcina work. It's wonderful. This, so this, these sources that were written in the concrete moment in which there is a, a, a complete change of a, of a territory, of a region, the introduction of, of new plants, uh, animals, techniques. Uh, we have in Alcina a very, well, very good reference of the previous moment and even how the new changes are coming into the, the and develop. Yes, very interesting. Thank you very much. Our next question is for Dr. Teresa. And it comes from Patricia Irene Dakudao. And she asks, the Villa Lobos expedition tried to grow maize in Sarangani, but they were not successful. When and where in the Philippines did early Spanish or Mexican colonizers first start to successfully produce maize? Um. I uh, really, perhaps Paulina can help oh, me. Sorry. Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> yes, sorry, sorry. perhaps Dr. Paulina. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sorry for that. The sources I have tell me that maize was first cultivated in Manila and La Pampanga. We say that La Pampanga was like the barn in the Philippines because there was a lot of production of rice there, but also, but also maize. But since maize or corn, is a plant which is very easily cultivated and harvested. It spread um, throughout the whole archipelago. Mm -hmm. Quite easily. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I think that the, um, sorry. No problem, okay. sir, please go ahead. I think that the, the Villalobos uh, problem was not only to, to harvest, so how to, so the problems with the environment but uh, that they were sailors, so it, maybe they, they tried to cultivate it, but in, they didn't know exactly how to do no. that, <laughs> and <laughs> they had many difficulties there. It wasn't their skill set. <laughs> they can navigate the seas, but not grow corn. <laughs> so perhaps that was what happened. 
And I think the, the next question is for you, Sir Dr. Demora. Based on the food stocks in the ships in the galleons, what would you say were the main considerations in deciding what food to bring? Was nutrition a significant factor? Well, that society from the 16th to the, to the 19th century, the, the people that, that, that work it on a, on a ship, they, they need calories, so they, they need uh, uh, to get food for that hard work. And uh, this is a, a question that I had already seen in Spain, even in Spain. Um, so the Spaniards uh, left Spain, went to America, were in America, sailed through American, around America, sailed to the Philippines, came back. They tried always to find ingredients. Uh, and so we can see in, in, in the load of, of food in the ships uh, the same pattern. So um, cereals is very important. Uh, meat, dried meat, better dried than salty meat. But anyway, there is also salty meat and dried meat. So for example, in the Philippines, there were no cows. So they tried to get carabao and to buy carabao. We have references for, uh, for the uh, San Felipe Galleon, I think. So the 1567, 60, 69 or 70s, they, they had carabao meat for the galleon. So they adapt. It's the same question in, in, in America. They adapt, for example, the Gatsby include in the, in the food from, uh, from Mexico to the Philippines. Well, they uh, he include corn, he include a uh, chili, so ají says said the document, and and also beans, so frijoles. So there is an ad adaptation. They had the same pattern: um, cereals, some legumes, dried meat, dried fish, um, some wine, any kind of wine. That's the explanation for, for, for using the, the tuba wine in the Philippines, for example. And um, from that on, then we can find different adaptations to the territory, the, to what, what, uh, what was at the moment Available. easier to find or cheaper to buy. Yeah, quite interesting. I would imagine vitamin C was was a big concern for, for long sea voyages and making sure they could avoid scurvy. And those, the it was difficult, but it is not, so we have to, to consider two moments in, in any ship, in, in any travel. The, at the beginning, they have many supplies, they have mm -hmm. variety, so they can change the menu, the diet. Yes. We have references of one day, so Monday and Wednesday and Saturday, we have rice with tuna fish. Yeah, we have that references. And other days we have legumes with uh, dried meat, for example. Um, there are different recipes even today in the popular gastronomy in different parts of the world that could be done in the Manila Galeon or in the Spanish ships uh, from Spain to America or uh, in all these travels. But obviously when uh, the journey go on, went on and there were not so many supplies and some of them were, uh, were not edible, they had to adapt and eat whatever they, they could have. Available, yeah. Must be very interesting to see what the cookbooks in that era. Oh, I'd like to, I to add a comment on yes, the please. scurvy yes. because the, uh, the Dutch and the English sailors were the first to use lemon juice to, not, to avoid not, not. <laughs> I'm not agree. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a document, I have a document <laughs> from the New Spain in which uh, the Spanish capture a Dutch vessel and they start to make questions to, to the captain and, and to the people, the vessel. And uh, the, the Spanish, he said, well, he said that he, they were looking for lemon juice to avoid scurvy. We, the Spanish, should do the same because we don't do that. We should do the same. It was at the end of the 16th century. And I have the document and I think I've written about that. Well, uh, the question is that they, uh, at the beginning of the 16th century, they knew that they need something 
to prevent scorbut. Uh, they had some experiences and they tried to get the food for that um, object, objective. That doesn't mean that they were right in that way. We, there is a very interesting reference from um, an army organized in Seville uh, that was sent to the Philippines in 1617, where uh, it is described the procedure of, uh, of Yemen use for the ship. They had, uh, so the document tells that they have to take the lemon and make the use just some days before uh, the departure. And they have to combine the lemon juice with oil. Um, obviously, this lemon juice for the trip was thought to, to prevent the scorebook, that is 1617. Even in the 16th century, uh, and the Magellan expedition, we there are two references very interesting for me. The first one is very common in the, at the beginning of, the, of this period, so the, the first half of the 16th century, and probably in Portugal can be seen also, and that is the use of carne de membrillo. So this, uh, this um, past done with sugar and the, um, and the quince, I think it's quince. So it's a local, local like an apple. And this is, it, it is still produced here in, in South Spain. It's sous. It's a way of uh, taking fruit for the journey and to preserve food. Obviously, that was not useful at all. But this presence of this uh, elaborated um, like candy has no sin in these uh, uh, simple ingredients that are on board if we don't understand it as an, uh, an, an idea. Or, uh, they try to get this, the, this food because of the scoreboard. The other thing interesting is that Magellan, for example, uh, they had a, a big quantity of mustard. So mustard, um, they were sailors. They were not so exotic and they were not going to cook every day with mustard uh, seeds. So uh, I tried to get information about that until I, um, I, under, uh, I found other references that is in the last two years uh, uh, from other trips, other, other vessels, that load musta, uh, some mostaza y oruga. Oruga is the Spanish old name for rucula. And uh, uh, a wild version of, of mustard and rucula is the jaramago. So it's very common in, in South Spain at field. So what they get to the ship to the for food are those plants and both of them are from the same family mm -hmm. i think family are very rich in c vitamin did they know what was c vitamin no no did they no. did they know that if they had that plants uh, they could prevent the scorbut probably so they, they tried to get solutions for that problem. Also, they didn't know exactly how to do that. They, they, the Dutch and the, and the English uh, in the 18th century understood exactly what was the problem of the C vitamin. Right. But uh, Spanish and probably so Iberian sailors, I'm sure that at the beginning, even at the, at the, at the, at the end of the, of the 15th century, they knew that there were some ingredients, some food that were useful to prevent scorbut. And then they needed to stay healthy. Very Can I add uh, yes, a few comments? <laughs> yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I don't know about lemon juice. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about lemon juice, but I know about oranges. And oranges were used by the Portuguese since very early times in their Carrera de India. So they knew that there was something about oranges and fresh fruits, fresh citrus, that was uh, important to prevent uh, uh, the, the disease. And also ananas, pineapples. Pineapples were used from the sailors, not because they knew about the content on vitamin C, but because they, 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 feel, they felt better when they, they had these fresh fruits. 
Um, and finally, a uh, comment on Pigafetta's voyage. Um, when crossing the, the Strait of Magellan, uh, there was uh, um, this plant. It seems that was uh, Apium graviolens, we don't know, but uh, it's, a, it's a, a plant that um, they, they, they collect and they uh, made the syrup and was this plant that helped them to to support the, the Pacific tra tra uh, the crossing. Uh, lots of them, the, the Pacific crossing, uh, it was three months and 20 days without seeing lands. And I think, I think uh, perhaps uh, my colleague Antonio can, uh, can confirm that uh, part of the, the, the health of the, the, the marine, the, 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 people, the yeah. population was uh, part due to the, this consumption of the, this apium they collect in the, in the strait. Uh, and also it was because it was rich in vitamin C, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. So El, so we have to realize that also Pigafetta seems to tell us everything. He just tells us part of the information that they had. There are yeah. some silent moments. For example, I, I explained uh, today that the, there is the stage uh, from almost a month in the islands close to Brunei. We don't know exactly what they did there. Uh, so happened also in some stages of the in other stages of the of the of the journey. Uh, the references of the um, of the um, up, um, I don't know the name in English actually now. The Apio in the um, from Magellan Strait or from Patagonia. Celery. Sorry. Celery. Celery. Cel um, Wait, well, they talk a sweet. They, they tell about a sweet uh, celery, I think. Uh, what my colleague had already. So this plant that they collected. This in the, yeah. Um, there is one of the, of the chroniclers, I think that is uh, Fernando de Oviedo, that explained, that explains that they preserve them in vinegar. That explains us the use of this uh, mustard from Spain to be preserved in vinegar. The presence of vinegar is very important in any lot of those ships. So it, has, it is logic uh, to understand that they try to preserve those plants because they, thought they, they, they used to, to get plants preserved in vinegar to prevent the, the scoreboard, or they thought that was useful to, to continue the journey and, and to and to save from so many days. So I think that what they they got in 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 Patagonia or the or in the Magellan Strait uh, that helped them to survive those that survived, obviously. And the okay. final word: there was a plant that the Spanish sailors used, a Mexican plant called choconosle, which is a fruit from a cactus um, near the California region. And um, it was really good for them. It had a lot of vitamins. Vitamins, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we are very uh, comfortable in our, our lives today. And we, re we reduce the variety of plants used in, yeah. in uh, ancient gastronomy because they, they, are, they are sour, they are hard, they are not so comfortable to be eaten. Yeah. But at those times, they adapt very well to what they found. They tasted what they, they had at hand and, and why not try to introduce in their, in their food. So that's the idea that I told about the ingredients, the techniques yeah. and the customs. So they try to get the final result, what is common for them, their customary uh, food. Yeah. They use the Spanish techniques. We know the, the introduction of the, of the the sofrito in the Philippines by the Spaniards and Europeans. Uh, and they use the ingredients, the local ingredients, because it's difficult to get the original ingredients. At the end, they're looking for a result, but that during the time, that explains the evolution of gastronomy anywhere. Right. That's a good framework to, to try to understand that, that evolution and how that intuitive, uh, intuitive approach to knowing what's good for you and what will keep you healthy. Uh, that's also very uh, interesting. 
we have another question from this time from Sharon Chong, and I think this is addressed to Dr. Apolina. Dr. Apolina, how extensive was the tobacco plantation and exports from the Philippines? Well, as I said, um, there were plantations in Mindanao and then in Northern Luzon. So it's not the same to talk about tobacco in the 16th, 17th, and 19th century and 19th century, because as I understand, the tobacco industry, the real tobacco industry in the Philippines comes from the 19th century. Um, and the, it's a period that I have not studied very well. So I cannot tell the extension of the plantations of, of tobacco. But what I can say is that at the end of the 18th century, as a result, of the Bourbon reforms, there were many plans that the Spanish administration encouraged native plants and plants that, that came from, from America to make the cultivation extensive. And tobacco was one of them, I think. But the exact amount, I cannot tell you that. Yeah, that's very uh, interesting. And we have uh, another unusual question. I think this was from the uh, talk of Dr. Demora. Uh, we have a question where, because in your list you had cats. Uh, somebody cats. is asking if, if cats, el gato, is part of the, <laughs> part of the diet. And mice. <laughs> and mice. <laughs> and mice. <laughs> yes, that's... I thought I think that it was um, in Cebu. So this is the what I told about the European perception of food. So we have to realize that they were foreigners in the Philippines. Uh, Pigafetta arrived because uh, this reference come from, comes from Pigafetta and try to, to see everything, to understand everything. He even make questions to the natives and try to translate and to uh, interpret the information. In some cases we have, through comparative studies, we, we get the, the solution and it's really evident that is very objective and descriptive. For example, the, the Tabon bird, uh, described by Pigafetta. Um, yes, they met a uh, Patabon bird and they even they taste it or they they ask for that information. Well, Pigafetta said that there were cats and dogs in Cebu. At the same time that he's talking about food. That means that they ate cats and dogs or just that he thought that they ate cats and dogs. That's the question. Yeah. We don't know exactly what he meant. That's the, the, the point that I said. I'm not telling how was the food. That's a long research that must yeah. be done through these comparative studies, archaeology, for example. It must be very important to this research, also anthropology, because we, we know cultures in which cats and dogs are eaten. Uh, even in Spain, <laughs> could, be, could be said uh, in ancient times. But we don't know exactly if, if what Pigafetta said is what was the real uh, use and, and the real eat of cats. Right. So it's, uh, we don't know what he meant. <laughs> we have to be very judicious with how we interpret uh, what is in the records that we come across. Thank you very much. And um, uh, just a time check, it is now 5.52. Perhaps we can take one last question. And this last question is from Timothy James D. Macali, and I believe this is addressed to Dr. Teresa. And his question is, short of understanding why piña cloth is unique to the Philippines, what was the possible impetus for its development in the Philippines? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh... Short of understanding why piña cloth is unique to the Philippines, what were the possible factors uh, that acted so that we thought about this innovation or that we thought about making fiber out of the piña, sorry, textile out of the piña fiber? Were there any social conditions or, or any pressing need from, from the community at that time so that 
the people thought to develop the fiber from the textile from the pineapple fiber. Mm. Thanks. Um, as I could understand, I'm not a specialist, but as I could understand, it was uh, the introduction of the, um, this kind of uh, uh, utilization of the fiber of the pineapples was introduced by the, the, mes- the, the missionaries, uh, the Franciscan missionaries. Uh, and so perhaps um, they saw, in fact, in Philippines, people have this, uh, this ability uh, to work on fibers with abaca or cotton or coconut fibers, but uh, the, ex- the, 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 the extraction of pineapple fibers and, and the use of the fi- pineapple fibers uh, was in fact uh, something that was um, uh, in, 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 placed in the, in the convents and monasteries, I think. It was the, the girls and the women that uh, that were there and learned uh, and learned doctrine and uh, uh, and the letters that were uh, uh, moved to 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 produce these this uh, this this, te- this um, textiles. Um, so I think that there are a cultural environment, a specific cultural environment environment here. Um, but I, I don't have any, uh, any specific other specific reason that uh, that uh, leads to the production of uh, of this this kind of textiles. But I think that in fact it was promoted um, by the, the missionaries this introduction uh, here in the there in the Philippines. I don't know if I I have asked the question because I, I I'm not sure to have uh, understood the question. Okay, uh, I think it was. Okay, uh, Timothy Di Makali, if you have a follow-up question, now's the time to ask. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Paulina, do you have any thoughts to, to add to that about the development of pinia fiber? Were there any particular social condition or social need? That- there is a, a comment of Michelle Eusebio that I'm reading. She's talking about tobacco and its incorporation to better chewing ritual. I just wanted to add that, for example, in India, they're mixed, they mix the tobacco with opium, and it was very common. We see a mixture of stimulants, many parts of the world. And I was just reading the, the comment because we're going to finish, and I wanted to answer that. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very interesting discussion. It was more than what I was <laughs> expecting. And you certainly, at least for me, uh, I speak for myself. This has been such an enriching uh, afternoon and there were so many, uh, so many interesting things to say. Pardon my video. It, it does this when the bandwidth gets, <laughs> <laughs> when the bandwidth gets uh, filled up, it will write itself in a minute. So thank you very much, everyone, for this interesting discussion. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for the open forum. And I'd like to thank our panelists again for sharing their time and expertise with us. It was truly such an interesting and enriching afternoon and so much food for thought that we will take with us because the next activity for us here in the Philippines is dinner. So this is something we can discuss with our (laughs) over a hearty meal uh, later tonight. So before I, we close this session, I would like to call on Dr. Nikki Briones Carsi Cruz to give us the conference recap and a preview of the upcoming events. Dr. Nikki? I'm on mute, sorry. Just very quickly for two minutes, I'd like to say that the week went by very fast. We have just finished today, the first part of a four-part month-long conference series. Part one was Legacies of the Encounter in Seafaring and Trade. And for the past week, we've had imagery coming from the sea of routes and maps and also things that were brought along those routes ending with our conversation today. But before we started part one, we had um, an opening keynote for the main conference, for the entire conference done by Paulo Jorge de Sousa Pinto. And that was on June 23, a week ago. And we had a keynote for part one from our very own Father René Javeliana from Ateneo. 
The next panels were on putting the Philippines on the map with the two Garcias starting a conversation from Portugal in the Philippines, followed by Iberian cartographic models of the Philippines by Miguel Rodriguez Lorenzo from Lisbon and Rafael Lotilia from Manila. And none of them repeated the same kinds of maps. We received feedback that people were seeing things they were seeing for the first time. And that continued the next day, trade routes where the topics of Guillaume Godan and Guadalupe Pinzon Rios from Mexico and Angelo Catano. And we also had um, Jorge de, Ma uh, de Matos, Semedo de Matos, who even if he spoke in Portuguese, he trusted that the maps would speak for themselves. And it reminded us that, yes, a ship was full of people from different places with different languages. Some would not read. And that's what maps were for. So that was also very well appreciated. Map four continued with that um, panel four continued with that theme on environment, seafaring, and shipbuilding. That took us two hours, a very lengthy conversation. I felt bad for Ivan Valdez Buvnov, who was awake at 3 a.m. until 5 p.m. answering questions. And of course, Greg Bankoff um, answered a lot of questions because it was a very engaging discussion. He did tell us that when he was watching the previous panels, he was finding insights for things he had not thought about or perspectives he hadn't seen before. And that continued today. As you can tell, we went over time, but the organizers were not forcing people to end on time because why stop a conversation that is so rare and so insightful and so enjoyable. Thank you very much, Paulina uh, Machuca, um, supposedly from Mexico, but staying in France and Antonio Sanchez de Mora from Seville and Teresa Nobre de Carvalho from Lisbon for joining us today in this very engaging conversation. In the middle of all this, there was a special panel on Saturday. Four artists came together, Pedro Palma from Lisbon, Kidla Tahimik from Baguio, Luis Francia from New York, and Ahmad Fuad Osman from Kuala Lumpur. The event was moderated by Simon Soon from Kuala Lumpur. And that panel you can also access that online, very different, but talking about representations of Enrique de Malaca, another way to converse from this title, from the perspective, uh, for, on this theme from the perspective of the arts. So that wraps up our event, but there were host departments within Ateneo that came together so that we could host the panels, the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies, Department of History, Ateneo Institute of Sustainability and Department of Environmental Science today hosting different panels. The moderators or faculty from Ateneo, myself included, Skilti La Bastilla, Lian Habana, and David Losada, and Abby Favis. And we would like to thank um, Chris Castillo, assistant to the ADSAS for Campus Events Management, and the entire Zoom event support team members. Every time we have something, there's two or three of them that are working together. June Tang, Bonnie, Mario, Jen, April, Dennis, John, Aleli, and Benito. Thank you very much for a whole week of technical rehearsals and live streaming. And our partners from the National Historical Commission of the Philippines and the National Quincentennial Committee Secretariat for making sure that our Facebook stream live streams to our wider audience. Uh, Ian Alfonso, Juvelin Nierves, Joseph Alec Rodilla, and we've also borrowed John Hell, Rabusa, curator of Museo El Deposito. Thank you very much, Abby, for giving me a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nikki, and we look forward to seeing everybody in the upcoming events. May I now call on the chairperson of the Department of Environmental Science, Dr. Maria Eileen Lea G. Guzman, for her closing remarks. Doc I. Thanks so much, Abby. Let me take this opportunity to first thank our three speakers for their very informative and interesting lectures. I'd also like to thank the organizers for such an exemplar event. It has been a pleasure in the Department of Environmental Science to co-host today's panel. Our lectures and discussions today clearly show the dynamic relation between the environment and human activities over the long term, from the plants that cross the Pacific and their impacts, to the pineapple that never left the Philippines, and the food that was available during Magellan's time, and how they have evolved. These are just some examples of how history and our understanding of it can provide better information that we, the present generation, can use to appreciate better the complexities of human environment relationships. Today's discussion, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an in 
inseparable network of mutuality tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects our destiny, one's destiny affects all indirectly. This is clearly evident in today's panel, or in this case, our love for certain plants, fruits, fabrics, and food that we now call our own here in the Philippines, but they're actually transplants. These are just some of our legacies of our encounter in seafaring and trade. With that, thank you very much and have a good day wherever you may be in the world. Thank you very much, Doc I, and thank you again to all of our speakers and guests. It has been such a pleasure for me to moderate this session today. We hope to see you in the upcoming events as we continue to celebrate contacts and continuities, 500 years of Asian Iberian encounters. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. That was Bye. So <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. We just ended the live stream, but the Zoom room is still open. <laughs> okay. <laughs>